Thank you for rejoining us. I'm Deanna Markham, and it is my pleasure to facilitate this panel this afternoon. We're celebrating the 50-year anniversary of the Mellon Foundation, and specifically the scholarly communication program. It's also very nice to have this celebration as part of ACLS's centennial celebration because the Mellon Foundation and ACLS have been so closely intertwined throughout their histories. And it, when Don Waters, the program officer for scholarly communication, asked me to lead this panel, he asked me to think about the appropriate venue. He explained that all of the programs within Mellon were looking for places to have a, a panel like this to look at the programs they've hosted over the years and to reflect on the difference those programs have made. And I immediately thought of ACLS because the pro program for scholarly communication at the Mellon Foundation has been above all about service to scholars. And it is in that context that we're going to talk to you today. To prepare for this panel, I had the most wonderful series of afternoons when I read every annual report from 1969 to 2018. And you know, you look at that and think, well, this might be kind of boring, I don't know. But it was fabulous. And I recommend, I hope that those little excerpts I sent in the materials, along with some of the highlights of the scholarly communication program, will pique your interest so that you will go back and read particularly the introductions of those annual reports. Because it is a sweep of changes in American society, changes in global scholarship, and changes in what's happening on university campuses. And they are really wonderful reading. I, I do highly recommend them. It was in 1999 that a program for scholarly communication was actually a formal program. Up until, from 1969 until 1999, the Mellon Foundation had supported a great number of library programs, um, scholarly programs of all kinds, but it was in 1999, and perhaps it was, I'm at least imagining that the then president, Bill Bowen, having seen the profound influence technology could have on scholarship when the Mellon Foundation created JSTOR, that he began thinking in much broader terms about ways in which technology could have an influence on teaching and scholarship much more broadly. And it was in 1999 that Bill Bowen hired Don Waters, who has been the program officer for scholarly communication since that time. And in 1999, Don Waters was working with me at the Council on Library and Information Resources. So Bill Bowen was a little bit sheepish in calling me and um, explaining why he was going to raid my staff but he said, I'm sure you'll understand, Diana. Um, the nation needs Don. <laughs> and indeed, the nation did need Don. And the nation is grateful to Don for all that he's done to make the program on scholarly communication a transformative program 
that is always in the service of scholarship and teaching. He looked at the requirements of the disciplines and the scholars working in those disciplines. And although many of the grants have gone to libraries and museums and cultural institutions, it's always been for what they can provide for those disciplines, which is what makes his program so incredibly important. And over the two decades that he's been in place, the Program for Scholarly Communication has awarded 1,710 grants, totaling just over $800 million. And that's about 12% of the total of Mellon's expenditures. There probably isn't a person in this room who has not benefited either directly or indirectly from the program for scholarly communication. So it was really hard for me, after reading these annual reports, to figure out which of the many things will we highlight in this panel. But we decided on three broad areas. And I'm going to ask the speakers to talk about these areas, and I'm referring you to the biographical material in your packet so we don't waste time uh, talking about their many accomplishments, and there are indeed many. But um, I've asked Tara McPherson from uh, USC to talk about the scholarly communication institutes that she was part of. This was a 10-year period um, in which Mellon funded institutes that brought together technologists, scholars, librarians to think about their future needs and how they would use technology to meet some of those needs. She will be followed by Michael Keller from Stanford, who's going to talk about some of the experiments and innovations of the scholarly communication program and talk about the importance of a third party taking the risk on behalf of all of us. And finally, um, reflecting on some of the lessons that have been learned, not only from those things that worked beautifully, but some of the things that failed and why did they? And really important, what did we learn from those failures? And finally, Sylvester Johnson uh, from Virginia Tech, who has not had Mellon funding. Um, he hasn't been a grant recipient, but as a university administrator who is working in the humanities in a technologically rich institution, what has he learned? from some of these innovations and experiments that have helped him think about the programs that he's instituted at Virginia Tech. We're going to try to keep um, these comments fairly brief because we'd like to hear from all of you too. I'm sure you have some contributions you'd like to make about the importance of the program for scholarly communication at the Mellon Foundation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tara McPherson. I'm um, Chair of Cinematic Arts at the School of Cinematic Arts at USC. And I think I'm here to represent the scholars Don has supported to do odd things, right? And I'm very grateful to Don and to folks who are not here like Abby Smith Rumsey, both who helped broaden my scholarly perspective in very vital and useful ways. I think um, Don has been very helpful in helping scholars escape their silos for decades. I once heard Don described as a scholar who became a feral librarian, um, himself escaping his silo at Yale um, and moving first into a library and then onto Mellon, where he has done much good. 
Consider a young historian investigating an 18th century massacre of unarmed Susquehannock Indians in Pennsylvania, an event that set off a pamphlet war, an, early era, an earlier era's fake news in the region. Through his research, the young scholar produces conventional print articles, but he also imagines his research outcomes circulating more broadly. He eventually builds Digital Paxton. Conceived by Will Fenton, Digital Paxton is an online project that blurs the lines between archival collection, critical edition, and teaching resource. Created in the platform Scalar, the project aggregates 2,500 pages of primary materials from over 18 separate archives and features dozens of contextual essays, a crowdsourced transcription platform, and extensive lesson plans for broad use of the material. Digital Paxson is a rich example of the possibilities for humanities scholarship in the digital age, bringing together original historical inquiry, expansive multimedia components, and teaching materials for a broader public. It models a vibrant form of public humanities, open access publishing, and collaborative knowledge production. The project also represents one outcome of the Mellon Foundation's ongoing support for scholarly communication under the leadership of Don Waters. While Digital Paxson received no direct support from the foundation, its publishing platform, Scalar, was founded in part by Mellon. More importantly, the project realizes a, vig a vision of digital research and humanities outreach that the foundation helped foment via the work of its scholarly communication program, and particularly through the scholarly communications institutes that ran um, beginning in 19-2003 through to the present. SCI investigated the possibilities afforded humanities scholarship by the widespread diffusion of digital technologies. SCI's investigations were focused on four core areas, scholarly practices, organizational models, including scholarly societies, modes of working, and infrastructure. There was a concern with how scholarship was produced and how its reach might be broadened beyond the academy. Several institutes centered squarely on disciplinary practice, engaging, for instance, architectural history in 2006 and visual studies in 2007. These institutes included scholars working with visual materials, digital databases, mapping technologies, and they seemed well-placed to discuss the shifting methodologies and evolving paradigms in their fields for research and publication. The fields were in need of new tools and infrastructure that might improve access to research materials, permit new modes of analysis, build research communities, and enhance publication formats. At the session for architectural historians, discussions addressed the need for new publication formats and new kinds of online collections that could capture and address the essentially dynamic nature of buildings. Some of the outcomes of those institutes years later include Sahara, which was developed by the society with support of Mellon and Art Store. It contains over 100,000 images of architecture and landscapes uploaded by the members. It documents the changing nature of the built environment capturing buildings and landscapes as they're used in various seasons, at different times of day, and from diverse perspectives. Another digital resource supported by the organization is Archipedia, an expansive online encyclopedia of American architecture that contains building histories, images, maps, and peer-reviewed essays for over 20,000 US structures. Both Sahara and Archipedia make some of their materials available to a broader public, infusing into academe some of the spirit that's fueled things like Wikipedia. SCI 5 centered on visual studies, a field that itself was only taking shape in 2007. Participants thought to reimagine scholarly research and publication 
in ways that better harnessed visual materials and that better connected visual evidence to the fabric of argument. The group also called for the development of technical literacies in concert with vital cultural literacies, underscoring that visualizations, simulations, data sets are not truths in themselves, but are indeed constructed, and as we've seen, likely to have immense social impact. I was part of that group, brought together with scholars, um, technologists, librarians, and a subset of that group, including me, went on to develop Scalar, an open source and free online platform that supports a large community of users, including students, scholars, university presses, libraries, and museums. Thousands of projects have been built in Scalar, and the platform and its uses continue to evolve. Such projects include Digital Paxton, with which we started, but also print companions to online, to online companions to print books, like this work by Kate Mondluck, which uses Scholar to create, Scalar to create installation archive. This is a digital supplement to her print book, which pulls together hundreds of videos that users have shot when they visited museum installations of the artists she's writing about in her book allowing the, the companion project to document user experiences of feminist art in rich and new ways. In other efforts, the Newberry Library is using Scalar to crowdsource the transcription of its collections, and university presses are using the platform in a variety of ways, including University of Illinois Press, which here is publishing open access books um, using Scalar as the platform. Students have taken to Scalar in a variety of ways. Um, this is a, a screen grab from an online work of interactive fiction by the artist and activist Misha, Misha Cardenas, which became part of her dissertation. SCI clearly initiated ripples of change across the landscape of higher education. Collectively, these ripples have generated scholarship that is imaginative, accessible, open access, far-reaching, and robust. Broader themes might be drawn from SCI's endeavors, including the ongoing tensions between the desire to experiment and the need for continuity and stability in academic work, the value of productive failures, and the need for scholars to move beyond their silos to participate in broader conversations about the university's future. Some of the projects launched from SCI did not blossom into unqualified success. Others achieved unanticipated results, far from their original plan. For instance, Mellon has funded a number of publishing platforms. It's very unlikely that all of these will be in sustained use in another 10 or 20 years. Yet these initiatives offer rich objects and experiences to think with and through, bringing together scholars, publishers, librarians, technologists, administrators, and the public in collaboration and dialogue. These conversations powerfully shift the imaginations of those involved. I know that this was true for me. The lessons of SCI are crucially important as universities grapple at many levels with the effects of technology on public discourse and on the very contours of democracy. SCI played an important role in galvanizing valuable experimentation, prototyping publishing models, and modeling collaboration across various institutions. But its impact was also larger and more diffuse. It prepared a generation of academic leaders to bring the insights of the humanities to bear upon larger technological networks at a crucial moment in our history. The overarching narrative of SCI and its contributions is still being written, programmed, and designed. Thank you. So I have the uh, distinction of having uh, helped persuade Don uh, Waters to move from the School of Management responsibility he had into the libraries at Yale, and then into the leadership role as executive director, director of the relatively new Digital Library Federation. So. Um, it's, it, it is nothing but pleasure to report on the last 20 years. I'm not going to cover the last 50 years, 
the last 20 years have about 1,500 uh, projects that could be reported on, and there sure, surely should be a monograph. So consider this uh, presentation like a frog leaping from lily pad to lily pad, avoiding the deep water of the pond, and especially the hungry bass awaiting such a treat. Um, the scholarly communications uh, program has focused on scholarly resources, academic publishing, preservation and access of digital uh, avatars and uh, out output, library services, and all of this very much uh, affecting digital humanities. The, um, this, this slide gives you a sense of the environment uh, conceived of by the scholarly communications uh, uh, program uh, and uh, for the humanities. It's, um, it's a good diagram. I would have added some more arrows and, and uh, pointers to this, but the, these are the basic, uh, the basic elements. And uh, this, by the way, will be in the paper, the long paper that I'm not reading today. So it will be uh, up on the um, ACLS website soon. Okay, let's, let's go down the, uh, the uh, taxonomy. Scholar resources. Among such projects as eCodices, La Roman de la Rose, the Electronic Enlightenment, various papyri and cuneiform projects, the Matthew Parker Online Library Project and its uh, sequelae represent the role of the scholarly communications program in stimulating uh, advancement. So the Parker Project began actually in 1575 when Matthew Parker Elizabeth, the first, uh, first Archbishop of Canterbury, died having collected about 550 manuscripts intending to prove that the Church of England had a separate lineage from the Church of Rome. Um, the collection of manuscripts there are incredibly important uh, on, about English history, philosophy, religion, of course, and it documents at some level the transit from, uh, the, uh, from the Church of Rome to the Church of England. The project began in 2002. Uh, it was intended by Corpus Christi College Cambridge, the owner of the collection. Uh, Parker had been a student fellow and master there. Um, uh, to make it possible for people to see the materials without touching them and uh, without having to travel to Cambridge. The University Library of Cambridge and the Stanford Libraries were partners with Corpus Christi in these, um, this digitization and then presentation project. This project ended up uh, uh, offering a website that at first was charged and now is available free to anyone. Uh, it led to a project called the Shared Canvas Project, which resulted in a data model making possible uh, specifications and requirements for presenting and sharing images. Um, uh, and it was based all upon um, interactions, fo focus groups and interviews with individual scholars and groups of scholars for several years. Um, I should point to the next, there we go. Um, this led to, the shared canvas model led to the international image interoperability framework conveniently contracted to IIIF. We all will know one another when we say IIIF. That project began effectively in 2011. It involves a a community and a consortium, a community of about 100 developers, and a consortium of over 50 institutions who are promulgating this collection of APIs that permit streaming of images from hundreds of servers operated by cultural heritage organizations around the world to individual scholars and students' uh, computers. There are lots of aspects of this that will show up in the paper that I encourage you to read, and of course there will be there are um, uh, uh, URLs uh, spr sprinkled throughout that presentation. The IIIF itself led to various viewers with various capabilities present in them. So the Mirador viewer is especially good for manuscript studies. It enables comparisons, reassembling manuscripts and pieces of manuscript pages that have been uh, diffused in various institutions around the countries around the world. Uh, uh, annotation using the open annotation standard and uh, measurement, uh, sometimes hyper multispectral analysis. The universal viewer, is, uh, which is uh, created by the Wellcome Foundation, is particularly good for uh, moving images, uh, time based media, but also has some of the same uh, functions as does the Mirador uh, viewer. Uh, the results of this effort, starting with the Pro Parker Project and leading right through the, to these viewers, are that there are now more possibilities for um, 
uh, scholars to um, make use of images, and some of them are 3D images, some of them are, are um, uh, time-based images and files for scholarship and for teaching. And I think especially that the annotations and the comparison of sources has, has been um, vital and much used. I would compare this effort uh, to the bamboo effort, which began in the late 90s and basically folded in the mid-2000s, early 2000s even, where the technologists who had been funded and supported by the Mellon Foundation uh, uh, had their own recipe for what digital humanists ought to do and what they could do. The problem was that the digital humanists uh, didn't agree with the, that toolkit and in fact felt that they weren't being attended to by the, by the people in the Bamboo Project. It fell in on itself. Uh, we're always learning from these projects, but one of the things we have learned from the Bamboo Project is we have to listen to the scholars and their requirements. Another category of effort uh, has to do with academic uh, presses uh, and academic publishing, and particularly with their university presses. Uh, one, of the, one of the considerations of the Mellon Foundation in general has been the free rider problem. There are about 114 or so university presses in the U.S. serving over 1,000 higher education institutions. So the 100 university presses have to support a very large number of scholars writing monographs that are intellectually important but are not going to be commercial winners. It's a big problem for us. So uh, among other uh, projects, there have been recurrent investments in university presses by the scholarly communications program to make university presses more viable. Uh, Tara has mentioned shared platforms, terribly important. Other efficiencies, I'll mention a few as I go along. Uh, there have been a couple of very interesting experiments which are ongoing. One is at Michigan, University of Michigan, the digital uh, culture books, uh, which are innovative works in new media studies and digital humanities. And another one is at the Stanford Press. Uh, it's an uh, inter interactive scholarly works program, publishing scholarship not accessible in traditional book form, but requiring interaction by readers with web-based resources and interpretations by scholars. These are always multimedia, including maps, images, videos, text, operating models, and these, all these projects are peer-reviewed, making them appropriate for consideration in appointment, uh, promotion, and tenure. Uh, another category has been preservation and the scholarly record. Uh, I would mention, uh, of course, the digitization of a great many uh, collections of manuscripts, early prints, newspapers, photographs, and the like. Uh, the very fact that these digitization programs occur mean there's less wear and tear on the originals and really more utility for about 95% of what um, uh, scholars want to do uh, other than taking the DNA of the vellum and um, examining the chemistry of the inks. Uh, there may be some others. I think another a matter of pride uh, that the scholarly communications program uh, has had and should have is in the Dunhuang Caves project, a multi-funder, multi-institution project based in China, uh, uncovering and making accessible uh, fabulous images from a series of caves. I should mention the the some of the technologies, uh, there have been uh, awards to what might be observed as competing technologies. Uh, Portico is one, it's a sort of a classic big database, text base, uh, with, a, with a central file, actually I think they're in two locations, versus the clocks, uh, locks and clocks um, uh, services. LOCKS is an acronym for lots of copies keep stuff safe. It's essentially a, a network caching program that mimics the network of libraries as they grew up over the centuries around the world when it's very difficult to remove all copies of a forbidden work, for instance. So LOCKS and CLOCKS have different, uh, different approach to the preservation and access problem than does por por uh, Portico. We all should be uh, applauding the art store, service has brought um, uh, uh, just a huge number of images for teaching and research to all of us at relatively low cost. And the relatively new projects of saving a single copy of a uh, hard copy of a work in uh, various locations on the east and the west of this country agreed by communities of practice in these, uh, in these locations. Now I think I can advance this to regranting. Um, Regranting programs uh, have been uh, supportive of the ACLS 
supportive of doctoral students, supportive of postdocs and internship programs. Uh, they have been focused in part uh, through the clear hidden collections programs on making information about hidden collections and digitizing, now digitizing hidden collections for better access. Digitization is a big deal, and in general, these projects are intended to involve not just a principal institution, but partnering institutions so that the techniques and the understandings of what has to go on are more widely understood and practiced. Another program that's just started recently is the Recordings at Risk uh, uh, project in which recordings, uh, sound recordings are digitized and thus uh, some of them made accessible where formerly they went, might not be or might be played, but played for the last time from the original media. I uh, point out the ACLS Digital Innovation and Related Grants that made possible some very remarkable projects through the ACLS, but I, um, I'm not going to go through them now because I don't have enough time. And then there's the support for young scholars that I've mentioned that has produced um, about 200 or more uh, fellowships plus these internships in libraries, archives uh, around, around the country. These are, um, both of those are from the, um, the CLEAR uh, organization. Now, standards. In the area of standards, the most important uh, and most significant development that has, me has had Mellon support are the Open Archives Initiative, which uh, makes open access work. The two protocols of interest are the, that for metadata harvesting, so you can discover what's available, spread out a great many repositories around the world, and the protocol for object reuse and exchange, which makes the objects, i.e. the text and the images, graphics in them and so forth, available for linking and thus, thus for use by scholars and students. Very significant developments. So um, the tools collection uh, is, is many and varied. I'm, I'm going to just mention a few. Fedora and DSpace, which are digital preservation and access applications that are used by individual institutions, uh, allows for more easy access than ordinary um, just hanging around the web might provide. Collection space and archive space are collection management applications that make the management of items in these, these archives uh, more easy. Zotero, uh, an application developed for scholars to manage their bibliographic data and digital research material. Bit Curator, which uh, is a set of applications that support digital forensics, very important. Uh, it's hidden in the back of your library and archive, but believe me, they are terribly important to you. And something called Editoria, which is uh, one of several digital workflows for book production. So now I think I go to my conclusions. I wonder where we would be without the scholarly communications program taking these risks in a time when there are so many technological changes over the last 20 years. And I predict there will be a great many similar changes, unpredictable ones, in the coming 20 years. Where would we be in the digital humanities, libraries, archives, uh, and among the scholarly community who need easy access to digital avatars of unique resources and to academic publishing? Uh, where would we be without the Mellon Scholarly Publishing Program? We owe them huge thanks and humanities-wide appreciation. We need, as well, uh, to understand how interactions with the scholarly uh, communications staff has focused our projects and our proposals, making them more easy for us to understand internal to the institutions uh, proposing them and to consumers of these projects outside. So I have to note again the acumen, the foresight, the patience, and the creativity of the staff of the scholarly communications program led by Don Waters. We should also note the benefits experienced by PIs, one of which is me, during the improvement uh, uh, of the proposals by the process known as Waters Torture, <laughs> a variant of whack-a-mole. Now, what of the future? What's coming next? So I have only a few predictions. The first is that there'll be more of the same changed and accelerated by new technologies and new possibilities. However, I believe there will also be proposals coming to the Mellon Scholarly Communications Program involving cloud storage and cloud computing, enabling much larger 
text, data, and image sets to be analyzed, considered, and used in scholarly processes. We already are applying artificial intelligence, machine learning, and neural networking to what goes on in cultural heritage organizations. There'll be lots more of that, and it'll be quite productive. And by the way, many of those uh, AI tools are already accessible and more or less easily used by the right kind of people in the right kind of places. And finally, uh, and this is something that's been underway for a little while, the expansion of the linked data approach for discovery and uh, the library and other processes in cultural heritage organizations will become very important and will vastly expand access and understanding of what the resources are for what we might call the expanded scholarly purposes. So my compliments to Don, my compliments to his staff and friends sitting right here. Uh, and uh, Don, thanks. It's been a great, great time. I want to extend a hearty thanks to Deanna Markham and to Sandra Bradley, to uh, the ACLS more broadly for arranging this event and for this invitation. Excited to be here with you today. And I want to summarize some of the events that have happened at my institution at Virginia Tech to produce something fairly remarkable. And that is to take an institution that was begun as a military school focusing on engineering, mechanical arts, and to have it flourish into what is today a comprehensive research university where humanities programs are actually thriving. How did that happen? A big part of that answer has to do with the Mellon Foundation scholarly uh, support for scholarly communications. This is an image of the beginnings of Virginia Tech. It started in 1872 as a land-grant institution that was a military school, so you see what is still called the Corps of Cadets who were lined up in front of, uh, this is Lane Hall, where my office was until just a few months ago. And uh, that building still has no elevators. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first brick building on campus. But it started as a land-grant institution that was focused on delivering education for the, the large majority of, of white citizens, so this was conforming to the racial segregation that was a national pattern at the time, who were needing to go into an industrial workforce and needed to have not just what would be considered liberal arts education, but mechanical arts, et cetera. And over time, underwent significant transformation. It started off as a Virginia mechanical and, excuse me, Virginia agricultural and mechanical college. And it by the 1940s uh, was officially changed to the Virginia Polytechnic Institute uh, because of its focus on technology and engineering. In the 50s, it began to admit African-American students, a trend that would uh, continue to grow in following decades. It became co-ed in the 60s, and uh, during that same decade, the university ceased requiring all of its students to be part of the Military Corps of Cadets. And in the 1970s, the state legislature of Virginia actually granted it university status. And so at that time, the, the name changed to what is official name today, the Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. But most of you will know it as Virginia Tech because in the 90s, that actually became the favorite way of referring to it. This university it today is, as I said, a comprehensive research university that, that has nine different colleges. And during the 80s, there was an attempt to grow the humanities. So Nikki Giovanni, who's pictured there to the left, was hired as a professor in the Department of English. And that was a huge boon to the development of the humanities. Uh, the, the hiring that happened across the university over ensuing years also strengthened the growth of the humanities. But it was particularly the ground shift that was due to the growth in digitization efforts that was an indirect result of, for Virginia Tech of the scholarly communications program. So although the Mellon Foundation did make one grant to Virginia Tech in the early 2000s for uh, a virtual Jamestown project, that was called, 
most of the growth was actually indirect. It was the fact that digitization was changing the environment and it was reshaping the way scholars understood what actually counted as scholarship. This was especially important for Virginia Tech because it drew on the university's already known excellence as being a leader in technology innovation. And it allowed that to be wed to a desire to actually nurture the growth of the humanistic disciplines. And so the digital humanities is a big part of this story. In the, the 90s, in 1997 actually, the university began uh, what it called an electronic uh, dissertation thesis project. And that was digitizing every dissertation that was created at the university. And so that, that became very successful. And in the 2000s, around 2010, that was extended to retroactively go back and digitize all the dissertations that had been created at the university before 1997. Jay's store, an art store, which grew out of the, the work of the Mellon Foundation's funding, also created a significant shift and, and there are many ways that this benefited the university, of course, just by participating as a member institution, which the university did starting in the, in the late 90s, uh, allowed access to this scholarly material. But it also did something else. If, if you walk into Virginia Tech's main library, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what I thought, and I've been there for almost two years. I thought, my goodness, how can anybody get any work done with all these students in the library? <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> There, the, the use of the library by the students has increased dramatically because as more materials were digitized and as more periodicals were available digitally, the university started removing those paper copies and they were moved off site. And this opened up tremendous space to the university. And so part of that went to actually provide more space for students to actually use the library. And, and their use grew by uh, a huge factor. And there's something else that happened, but I'll just name the last point here of digitizing special collections at Virginia Tech. That also became an outgrowth of the kinds of environment that was created by the scholarly communications program from the Mellon Foundation. This, this became the trend and it became possible. It didn't seem like a wild idea. It actually became the expectation that scholars should be able to access material that one institution had by getting online and being able to conduct their research. This fed the humanities research that was happening out of the university and it fed a number of other projects that began to emerge. Now, I said that that digitization that resulted from uh, the creations of JSTOR and ArtStore, which Virginia Tech was participating in, was embraced by library administrators. This, this was a good decision. Uh, although some faculty did and still do say things like, I can't believe they're taking all the books out of the library. There, there are still books in the library. They're not all gone and many have been relocated, but it is a more efficient use of space. There was actually space for something else. And that something else were the digital humanities labs that were created. And there are several of those in the library one is a media design library, a, a studio rather, the other a virtual environments studio. The media design studio is, allows for things such as podcasting. So the scholars who want to share their insights from their research through a different medium can go there, they can get a very easy intro to the equipment and it's a very clean sound room. You close the door and you can't hear anything outside. Uh, and there are even small sound booths uh, for this. The virtual environments is immersive reality, VR and augmented reality with experts there to help you shape your project. The Athenaeum is a digital humanities space for teaching. I have an image of that to follow, one of the following slides. Data visualization is another where any, any student or scholar who has data that they'd like to represent visually can get help doing that. And the Fusion Studio brings together teams of, of faculty or students who'd like to work continuously on the project over a few weeks or months. And so there's space for them to do that. This is a shot from that Fusion Studio where your students are working on an ongoing basis. 
Uh, this is what's called the cube. The cube is not in the library, but it's connected to the library teams. And it uses about 148 different algorithmically controlled speakers, as well as projectors to produce a spatial experience of sound. So you hear different things based on where you move and you can get an immersive experience of a variety of different issues. This is a product of the visualization studio that's happening in the, the digital humanities. And, and also, the Athenaeum is a teaching space, so there, there are about eight monitors in that room. The ceiling is fully mic'd, and a camera allows for interaction, so faculty who are teaching digital humanities courses or who are doing digital humanities workshops or symposia can meet there and interact at a distance with people. Everyone can be heard because the whole ceiling is mic'd. You just speak normally. Uh, these kinds of developments have resulted from the, the kind of ground shift that the scholarly communications program, a funding program actually created. One, among the lessons to be learned for this uh, is the importance of uh, thinking about what some of the future challenges is going to be. Today, I think Virginia Tech is actually a success story for what can happen with great support for the humanities. Uh, it has a dedicated role, a university-wide role for the arts in the Office of the Provost, as well as the humanities. So it's a very unique kind of arrangement. Its Beyond Boundaries vision is very comprehensive that connects the humanities to some of the very central initiatives that are happening. But things could have gone very differently. And actually, this is, this is not a typical story of the humanities at a public university. Uh, the typical scenario uh, that, especially at public non-elite universities, is that there's austerity, budget sh shortfalls that end up uh, depleting programs or not renewing faculty lines. And so in the future, it will be very important for external funding to happen on an equitable basis. We all know that a grant application or a book proposal that comes from a faculty member at a very elite, private, wealthy university is more likely to be funded than a comparable proposal from a public university that is, is not as elite, even if the, the quality of the project might be the same. Going forward, this has to change because the, the inequality that is part of our larger modern society is actually sharply reflected in our academic institutions. And the difference in the capacity of funding internally between our wealthiest institutions and those that are private and those that are public is tremendous. Our nation's wealthiest university, for example, has an endowment that is 40 times greater than the endowment of uh, Virginia Tech and more than 800 times greater. You didn't hear me incorrectly. I said more than 800 times greater than an historically black college in Virginia, Virginia State University. That's a huge difference. Those differences are only going to continue to increase more drastically. And what this means is that our external funding entities, such as the Mellon Foundation, will actually need to be much more deliberate about more equitably funding projects that are happening in our nation's universities. And this is gonna be even more important for the humanities at public universities. Uh, so this is, this is a fascinating story that I like to tell when people ask me, what's it like to teach at a school with tech in its name since you're in the humanities? Uh, it's actually been very positive. The indirect impact of the Mellon Foundation has been tremendous. And the challenges that we're going to see nationally for our institutions are not going to be easy. But with, with more equitable funding, with the much more focused, uh, concerned with the long-term probability of success for the humanities at the varieties of institutions that, that need to include not just top-tier universities, but also community colleges and regional universities and colleges, uh, we can actually ensure the best types of outcomes for the future of the humanities. Uh, we don't have much time, but I'm, I want to give uh, people in the audience an opportunity to ask questions of the panelists or to make your own observations 
about the influence of this very important program. Yes, I'm uh, David Vandermeer from the Bibliographical Society of America. Uh, I think we've all benefited tremendously from these wonderful programs you've uh, uh, summarized for us now, and I, I thank you for that. Uh, the society I'm representing here uh, has a special concern of, uh, uh, with physical objects, uh, particularly books. But like any physical objects, uh, they reveal something about their creators, uh, they reveal something about the lives of those who've encountered them over the years. Um, the, um, uh, I was struck by the last two presentations where um, uh, the value of those was, uh, I fear, minimized as, as objects. Um, the, um, uh, those who attempt to reconstruct the lives of others, uh, or as we heard this morning, recuperate the lives of others, um, are, are not, as <laughs> a, an Ithaca report said, edge cases. Uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, nor uh, are they concerned with esoterica such as, uh, simply as DNA evidence or the chemistry of ink. Uh, these are attempts to reconstruct the lives of the past, how, for the history of reading for instance, how did people actually experience this. Uh, we've, we've, we saw an illustration this morning about an object that uh, cannot, a picture of it, no matter how they do it, cannot capture the full sense of what that object is. That object is necessary. And so I'm, I'm wondering um, how it has happened that in the course of these wonderful advances, uh, books have become denigrated. Uh, libraries are not only moving them off site, but uh, uh, destroying them. And uh, again, some of these projects give justice to that, uh, including having a copy on each coast. Uh, there are all sorts of fallacies in that approach, uh, uh, perhaps not to the communities that you indicated you consulted, but there are certainly people who object to that and have uh, many answers. Um, the MLA back in the 90s had a wonderful report on uh, the value of physical objects. Uh, that is virtually ignored in the, the library literature that I'm familiar with, but it is very much prominent in uh, other circles. So uh, in the name of humanities and uh, trying to find out how people in the past live, uh, can you offer any insight into why the disparagement of books has occurred? I, I'm going to ask Mike Keller to respond to this question, but I do, I want to say just one thing. We didn't spend too much time in this panel on the preservation projects that Mellon has, has funded over the years, but those have, many of those have been very much connected to um, the physical object, so I will just make, do look at our papers and see more, but Mike, you have. So the fact that I didn't mention what we do in support of reading and collecting physical books and physical manuscripts has no bearing whatsoever on your um, impression. Let me tell you that we acquire up to 150,000 books a year and since 1993, we've, uh, we've acquired over 7,000 special collections in physical form. The reason we have talked about these projects that have been supported by the Mellon Foundation is that they have materially made more possibilities for scholarship, more possibilities for examining, at some remove, digitized manuscripts and books, more possibilities for searching for words, phrases, and ideas in books and newspapers and any other text forms, more possibilities of, understand, of understanding and, and uh, analyzing images than is possible by a human in one place. Without digitization, without improved metadata, many of these new possibilities for scholarship, especially in the humanities, would not be possible. So please, because we didn't mention what we, have, what we are doing with physical objects, does not mean that we're not doing it. And I love books. I mean, I think my husband would tell you perhaps a little bit too much as they overflow every available space in our home. And, you know, I think it's very important to preserve 
books and engage in the history of the book. But I also teach in a field that deeply engages visual resources, including the moving image, which are poorly represented by print books. So I think that, you know, for some fields, um, a print book is the logical extension and outcome of the scholarship at hand. But for many other fields, um, the digital possibilities available to us now allow new forms of scholarship um, that better respect the evidence and the material that we're engaging with as scholars. So that being able to use a film clip in an argument about that film clip holds a scholar, I think, to a higher standard than a film still in a print book. So I think um, scholarship, in my mind, in an ideal world, would take the form best suited to its argument and its evidence. And in many cases, that form will be a print book but in many cases it will not. Okay, are, are there other questions? If you please stand if you have a question so we can get a microphone to you quickly. Hi, Helena Kalinda, I'm at the Luce Foundation. So I'm a, in the, on the funding side of things and one question I have is if you could talk at all about, I mean the, the Mellon Foundation has invested con, a considerable <laughs> amount over 20 years and should be applauded for that. But my understanding is that everyone is still wrestling with how projects can be funded. The, the whole question of um, equity was, was, was mentioned. We know institutions are under great stress financially. So I would just appreciate some, some comment on that as a part of future thinking. Thank you. Sylvester, do you want to respond to that one? Sure. Uh, the, the future of the funding is certainly not going to be a situation where there's, there's uh, more money than there is need. <laughs> uh, but, it, but it needs to be better than it is. Uh, so I've talked a little bit about the, the challenges for equity. There will have to be, uh, I think, two, two strategies for particularly for public universities that depend on state support, that is currently on the average around less than 20%. 15% uh, is not uncommon. And, and one of those is to try to shift the politics so that there is more support and so that there is a growth in treating education as something that, that should be uh, publicly supported as opposed to privately supported. And that's not a zero-sum game. That doesn't mean that there should be. The other is that I, I do think there, there, have to be, uh, there has to be a shift in the funding imagination around higher education. Uh, I think that our professional societies need new business models. They have to be different. And, and one of the examples that I use is that uh, a, a small number of our universities uh, essentially begin to function in large measure, not in a totalizing way, as real estate companies decades ago. And, and I don't mean that as some kind of cynical joke. I mean that in a very serious way that they did. And I, th I actually think that was good because what it has ensured is that they can continue to thrive in a setting where it's much more expensive for students to be residential. Let's take Columbia University as an example. It costs a lot of money just to physically be there. But Columbia University, for the time being, can make that possible because they got really seriously into real estate. That, that does not come to mind as a conventional business model for a university, but it is actually part of their business model. And I think our universities are at a point where we actually have to think more creatively about how to fund our mission. Uh, that's not a total solution, but it's part of it. There has to be the political shift. And I will say one more thing, and that is in the next 10 years, uh, economists project that, that the AI technology is go sector is going to add about $15 trillion to the global economy, give or take a trillion, <laughs> over the next decade. Uh, that there, had, there, will, there will not be a shortage of wealth in our economy, but we do need to be very, we need to have a different way 
of shaping the outcomes for our economy. And, and if we don't do it, it won't be because there wasn't enough resources. But I think now is the time for us to get creative about how the massive amount of wealth that's going to get generated just in 10 years, that's not even 30 years, <laughs> that's just 10 years, can actually go to support some of the most important things that are happening in our society. Thank you. I'm afraid we'll have to stop here, but please join me in thanking the panelists and thank all of you. Thank you.